welcome to Access to Perspectives Conversations. Today with Stephanie Gauthier. Welcome, Stephanie. Thanks for being on the show. Hi, thank you for having me. So today we talk about how to preserve your mental health during a PhD program. Um, could we, could you perhaps start by sharing with us um, a little bit about your background, Stephanie, and what got you involved in the work with Remo, what Remo is, and um, yeah, why why you do what you do nowadays, and also yeah, again a little bit about your research career so far. Sure. So it's a long journey actually to come here. So I've been a PhD student in France, but I was a part-time PhD student in information systems. I was actually living in Russia at the time. So I've been doing my PhD, uh, maybe for some people not in the most optimal conditions, but in conditions that were actually suiting me quite a lot because I was away, I had my independence and I had very good communication with my supervisor. So I never um, suffered from being far away. In the middle of my uh, PhD uh, journey, I actually went to uh, Ireland because in Russia I was, having a uh, I was having a job in industry and it was not really compatible with finishing my research. So I got offered a research assistant position in Ireland, went there. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things when I was there, because it was the first time uh, when I was actually hosted in a lab, and I started to let's say grow my my network and and be it in Ireland or be it in in other places. I saw a lot of things which I didn't find um, necessarily right as to what was happening with PhD students. I saw uh, some professors who had like five, six, seven PhD students dropping out of the program over a couple of years. And nobody in their institutions would actually think they should investigate what was happening. I mm -hmm. saw some PhD students uh, drop out, supposedly because they didn't make enough progress, but actually they never really had any form of proper supervision, if I may have that judgment. So I just started mm -hmm. to think that some things were actually uh, not so nice in academia. So much so that when I defended my PhD, I was really not sure what I wanted to do. And I was thinking about dropping out of academia. Um, some people told me that, yeah, but you know, it depends where you are. The culture is not the same in all the, the countries, in all the, in all the labs, in all the disciplines. So I took on a, a postdoctoral contract for eight months uh, in the Netherlands, which ended up being extended and extended and extended, which was very good for me. Uh, because there I, I, I saw completely uh, different things than, you know, now I'm a permanent, uh, on a permanent position in France. I'm assistant professor in information systems, and I'm very happy that actually I stayed in academia. Mm -hmm. But still, it doesn't change that, uh, you know, when you see the struggle of the PG students, you have yourself the, the struggle of having short-term contracts and having to run after extensions and so on. You realize that even your own mental health is actually sometimes at stake. So I wanted to get involved and do something for other people like me. Mm. Okay. Um, so maybe before we dive deeper into the hows and whys, um, let's maybe start with the definition of mental health. Um, how would you define mental health on a personal and a professional level if there's a way to differentiate yeah so well for me it's one same definition and it sticks to the definition that's given by the world health organization uh, having let's say a, a good level of mental health is being in a state of mind when you can realize your full potential when you can flourish when you can really uh, become who you who you would like to be and who you can become Mm -hmm. uh, being able to cope with the, the, the stresses of life. So it's not about not seeing stress or not feeling stress. It's about realizing that, you know, there's always going to be some stressors around you, but somewhat being in a state where you can actually deal with them to become the better self that you can become. Okay, so it's basically to feel safe, to be willing to learn, to have enough energy to actually dig in to a new topic yeah 
exactly yeah what defines us as humans maybe also to some degree and then like how i i personally understand like when there's issues with mental health is that there's stresses but we get to that um so yeah it's basically what what we would maybe consider as a status quo or normal a status of norm normality possibly or so to be mentally healthy means to be capable of uh, learning, be capable of um, exploring new topics, studying and researching in an uh, academic environment. There is also a bit of uh, that type of definition that I think we, we must always take a bit critically. I think WHO says that you need to, you're in a good space when you're able to be uh, productive and uh, mm -hmm. to make a contribution to your community, which I agree with. But then, you know, seeing life through the prism of production is already in itself some form of uh, philosophy or ideology, how, how you want to put that. But ideally, mm -hmm. if, if we take it down to, to the PhD student or the postdoc or the, the young researcher, it should be to be able to be mentally healthy would be uh, being able to uh, do your research, do your contributions, deal with the fact that it's going to be challenging and uh, be in a space where you realize that you are growing as a person while you're doing it. I think it's a bit about that. But it's mm. really about realizing that it's, it's going to be hard. And I, I think it's always a, a key point, you know. Nobody, nobody in the community uh, can, can tell you that doing a PhD is easy. But what people want you to know is that the journey is going to be hard, but it's going to be amazing. And that's going to help you to flourish. But, you know, to be able to do that journey, I don't know if you have to build resilience. I don't know if it is about, you know, something else, but there, there needs to be something that helps you uh, to, to try to accept the challenges and, and move through with them. And that can take the shape of many different things. You could have a very nice support system. You could have a very nice supervisor. You could have a wonderful topic that you're carrying around. Whatever it is that helps, basically. Mm. Yes, maybe it makes also sense to have a list of the security net or the backup system and the people also that hold your back while you explore new ventures. Yeah, I think that's super important, especially because now more and more PhD students, they have to move around in the same way that I did. And when you are moving from country to country, you don't have that support system with you. You have to build it again from scratch because your friends are still your friends, but they're very far away. So they don't really, I mean, you can explain them as much as, as you want, but it's not the same having friends that you can call on Zoom or having friends with whom you can go and have a drink when you feel like it, right? I mean, we all felt that during the different lockdowns. So I think it puts the mental health of the PhD students under even more strain. And if you start a PhD right now, and when before going somewhere, you should try to take time to realize what activities do you want to do? What type of, I don't know, meetups or any other form of uh, communities you want to join? Because you need to start that from the beginning of your PhD. So the day when it gets hard, you already have someone around you that you can turn to. If you don't, you will realize later down the road that, oh, things are getting hard and I need, I need friends, I need the community, but it will be hard to actually knock at some door. So I think that's super mega important. Yeah. Um, we also, there's, there's different terms and, and definitions that rotate when it comes to mental health. And another one that's quite commonly used as well-being or mental well-being in particular is the difference between mental health and mental well-being. Well, in my view, uh, mental health and mental well-being are related concepts because you are in a, let's say, in a good state of mental health when you are in a state of well-being. If I may say so, uh, I think the words they convey something that's a little bit different. So, when you say mental well-being, you put it in a positive light. And when you say, you know, mental health, people associate it with a form of stigma. So that may be why we have both words in a way uh, going around. Yeah. But if you look at the words, just what they are, um, it's like to have good health is, is something we all should aim for or preserve. 
also mentally and not only physically, but the mental part is often neglected or not or stigmatized, as you just said, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, and that will then ensure well being altogether. And as we also probably heard, is that one like physical well being or discomfort um, leads to mental discomfort and vice versa. So the two also interact square on. Yeah, yeah. We, we really should not separate the two. So I'm really not uh, about dualism, mind body dualism doesn't work. So we mm. have to take care of our bodies also in order to feel good. So when you're thinking about, you know, okay, maybe I don't feel like in my best, uh, my, my best self, what can I do to feel better? One of the first advice that people are going to give you is go and get uh, some, uh, some, some practice done, go and do some sports, just move mm -hmm. and try to get yourself back into shape. And I really think that you are connected. It's important to keep uh, track of that. And it's also one of the advice that we give to the, the people who are just starting their PhDs, pay attention to your health. Just because that's going to, to, to your physical health, because that's going to help you down the line. So again, if you arrive to a new city or to a new country, find time to actually get to a, a GP. Just find a doctor, find someone you can, you can go to. Try to be mindful of your diet, of your sports, anything. If you have had previous health issues, which you know a lot of us have, Make sure that you can find the medication that you need. In some countries, you know, it might change names or it might be more difficult to find, but you have to establish that uh, as, as a baseline. So it's okay the first month or the first weeks of the PhD to actually take time to really set up properly. You may feel like you are wasting time, but you're going to be uh, saving time further down the line. Because if you can have regular health checks, when you know that you're feeling okay, you know uh, also uh, you, your doctor, so you know that even if maybe at some times you're feeling more depressed or you're starting to feel that you're not really uh, mentally healthy, you know already know at which door you can knock. And then the mm -hmm. city can tell, refer you to a doctor, can refer you to whoever they know that is around that can help you further. So don't, uh, don't forget that and try to stay as, as physically healthy as you can, which of course is not not always um, not always easy. Mm. I think it's important to say uh, people have a lot of advice, but following it all is not easy. And I realize that as I'm saying, you know, we are advising for this or advising for that. I, my mea culpa. I know it's really hard to get it over. Mm. Yeah, and also. Uh, like this yeah okay so let's talk about the stressors again what i wanted to say was also towards don't aim for too much you don't have to run a marathon but just to go for a walk once a day get out under the sun is already something because it's so easy during a phd program to get stuck in the lab or behind the screen because you're so because deadlines are always there and you need to finish yeah. this and that i'm um, laughing but, because when i was doing the phd in the end I, I was living so close to the lab that the only thing I was doing was walking from my apartment to the lab back and forth, mm. you know, and um, I was using those, uh, those uh, Fitbit thingies, that, you know, to count the number of steps. And I mean, mm. it was so close that I was not even uh, walking a thousand steps a day. And like the average that we are recommended is 10,000. So I'm not advocating for the 10,000, but realizing that you actually need to get out for a walk. Mm. It's important. So I totally agree with you. I don't have to run, but at least make sure that I'm that I'm keeping okay. Mm. So let's talk about uh, the stressors in academia and what stressors PhD students are likely to encounter and probably to 100% just to brace ourselves and also for, for those of us who have been there and those who are, of us who are currently in a PhD program, what are stressors that by themselves are just part of the program but um, by identifying them as stressors we can also find a, a, um, a counterpart and how to mitigate the stress that it brings about so in your experience um, what are situations or factors in a phd program that can stress people to exhaustion so there are different types of stressors 
there are stressors that uh, are described in the even in the literature as you know more uh, individual. They would be something that's related to uh, what people have as a sense of self worth as their identity, but also uh, about their personal situation. So they don't, the, the literature doesn't exactly describe for the moment the effect of international mobility, but it describes the effect of having to care for someone. So if you have, I don't know, like a child or a spouse or a parent that you're actually caring for, any form of uh, informal care plus PhD and, and family life increases the risk uh, that you have to develop some form of uh, mental health issue during the, during the time of the PhD. So these are things that I don't uh, feel uh, qualify if you want to, to, to discuss in the sense that it's, it's perfectly normal that everybody has their life and they need to keep moving on with it. So maybe here, you know, people need uh, to be thinking about their support system and how much they're taking on. But what I really want to say is that it's not only about the individual and their own situation. There is also a lot more stressors that are sometimes very often less uh, described by the literature that have nothing to do with what the, individ who the individual is, but they have everything to do with what the academic system is about. Mm. So among those stressors, you would find uh, some things that would be systemic, and they are about the way in which uh, academia is built. We are built in a, in a way that we have to encourage excellence, and excellence would take uh, the shape of many papers all published in top tier journals, because otherwise, of course, they are worth nothing. That's what the system is telling us. Um, but this is uh, putting a lot of pressure on the shoulders of the PhD students because they're just here to learn to do the research. So trying to tell them that they need to aim super high uh, with their publication uh, needs to come at least with some form of scaffolding. So of course, I, I want everybody to be able to uh, aim towards what they believe is the best that they should be aiming for. But once they have that aim, the system should be helping into, in order to realize when that goal can be achieved. So how realistic is it for you to wanna do it during the time of your PhD or, or a couple of years after and provide with the help that is required in order to reach that. Mm -hmm. Then systematically, we also have issues with the job market because we have, uh, I'm sorry to say, but too many PhD students for the number of positions that exist in academia. And the academic system um, tells you that if you end up in industry, in a way it's because you have failed to succeed uh, in uh, finding a job in academia, which I don't think should be the message that we are sending. Actually, developing a lot of PhD students is a good way to invest uh, for you know the, the perspectives in terms of innovation and research in the in different countries, but it's also perfectly okay to realize that all that research and innovation is not going to be done in academia. Some people really want to go to industry. So don't make them feel like they have failed because it's really hard, you know, to get out of that four or five years journey with that uh, with that on your on your shoulders. Mm -hmm. But because we think about you know the whole uh, publication excellence and you have to fight hard to be in academia, it leads to a toxic culture where people think they have to stay in the lab forever. They have to be there. They have to be part of the walls. They should not go on vacations. They should actually dedicate absolutely all of their time to the PhD. Um, I don't think it actually works. And it's not only I don't think it. Some, some, some studies uh, already show that. I think the Max Planck Foundation and the N Square Network, they have figured that people who don't take holidays, they are actually uh, feeling uh, strong anxiety much more often than PhD students who find time to take some holidays. But you know, holidays, mm. they help you to get resourced and find new ideas. So these things are mm. And then you have institutional issues. Um, in some institutions, it may not always be very clear what is expected from a PhD student to succeed. I mean, what is sufficient for you to go and submit your thesis? because you will hear a lot about, again, those excellent, uh, the, those goals of excellence, where you have to have, I don't know how many publications and things that may not always be uh, reachable, but perhaps, you know, the, the, 
the requirements for you to finish your PhD program are not that high. Most of the time, they actually are not. But we need to be clear as to what needs to be achieved or not. If you're not clear on that, you're going to put yourself a lot of pressure, usually uh, much more pressure than what is needed. And also, you will not be able to, in a way, manage your supervisor because the supervisor also may want you to uh, uh, publish with him or her and sometimes may push you a little bit further than, than, than what you, you might need. So it's up to you to be able to know uh, when you could say no or when you realize that you actually want to follow them. So I think that's important. Uh, institutionally, sometimes problems with uh, supervisors and their roles. So what is the role of the supervisor? And what are the duties and the rights of the PhD student? So if your PhD program has set up some form of uh, booklet explaining you uh, what you may require uh, from your supervisor, what you actually should expect from them and vice versa, I think it makes the rest of the communication with the supervisor much easier. So it's a lot of issues. And I, I think it's important to realize it in that way, because if you talk, and when I was a PhD student, it was the same. When you talk to PhD students, most of the time they believe the problem is the supervisor. And sometimes it is true, but sometimes we also feel that way because the supervisor is the only thing between us and the system. Mm. But you can't, I don't think you're going to go very far if you're just fighting with your supervisor. So let's try to have a broader view of all those different elements, what also the supervisor may suffer from. And typically the supervisor has not been trained in order to uh, supervise PhD students. The supervisor is there because the supervisor managed to uh, write tons of, uh, of papers before. So they may need help as well. So if we take maybe that approach and we try to figure out, you know, why is it difficult for them? Why is it difficult for us? We can actually have something to talk about and make a plan with the supervisor as to how we want to communicate, what are our objectives, what do we consider a normal workload or not, and so on. Mm. So you are now also a supervisor yourself, right? Yes. Um, since when? How long have you been in the in the <laughs> career stage of yours? And how many people are you guiding? Um, I have uh, one PhD student and I have three DBA students. So the DBA students are making some form of a professional PhD, if you want. And of course, mm -hmm. I've supervised many uh, master students over the years. Mm. But I'm still kind of uh, early, let's say, to, to, to that stage myself. And yeah, what I experienced also as a PhD student myself, I saw that my supervisor was always busy at his desk trying to secure funding. Like there's lots of paperwork to process in academia. So, could you share some of the stresses that um, that exist at your career level of a supervisor or lab, mm -hmm. um, lab leader? Uh, the stresses are um, that we are also under pre pressure to publish still always, it doesn't go away. Uh, sometimes, yes, there is the pressure of the funding. I don't have that in my institution, so at least I'm, I'm, I'm protected from that. But also mm -hmm. when we are early in our career, we have to learn to juggle between the, the teaching and then the, the research supervising and also the services we need to do to the institution. And a lot of it comes as, you know, um, brand new experiences. Again, because the system makes us doctors based on, you know, our potential for research and initial publications, which we have to continue to prove. When you're a postdoc, most of the time you're not actually teaching. So finally, when you get your, your, your permanent position, if you're lucky enough to have that or tenure track position for those who have to go through this, you have to learn to do both the, the pedagogy and the research at the same time. So that can put uh, a, lot of, a lot of strain, I would mm. say. And do you actually still have time to do research yourself? Yes. Or... Okay. Yeah, no, I, I have found a good position that actually enables me to have a lot of hours for research. And I also decided to put my teaching in one, over one semester. So I just teach a lot for three months. And then the rest of the time, I can be dedicated fully to all of the other projects that I have. 
but that's mm. you know because I have been uh, in a space where I could I could organize myself like that. Where I've been before in other countries, I could see people who actually had eighty percent of their time dedicated to teaching and twenty percent to their research. So then that's of course a completely different uh, situation. Yeah, and now um, how do you? How do you try and maintain a good relationship with your with the people in your lab that you're supervising? And do you can you sense when they're um, in danger of getting into trouble for their own well-being? And how can you help them to avoid that or to basically stay in safe grounds? So what uh, I do when I feel something is not going okay usually the the signal for that is when you don't see your students so much more they are mm. somewhat uh, not so responsive they are not explaining you what they are doing you don't see them around then for me that's a sign um, mm. so then i just say you know hey i haven't seen you in a while do you want to come over to have a coffee and chat and then i just try to you know get to the to the bottom of things mm. um, Luckily enough, the PG student I supervise is also someone that uh, I have known as a master student. So there is already, let's say, some history that I think we can trust one another. Mm -hmm. And I try to be very uh, direct. So at some point, if I feel something is not OK, I won't just ask, you know, what type of uh, support do you need? So I don't know. For instance, I could really say, you know, for the moment, we have let you be uh, very independent with your tasks. But is that something that helps you or is it something that gives you too much pressure? Because if they want me to actually structure, you know, their work more, I will do it if it can only help them. So mm. that's my way. But I, I think it's also because I'm very early in the process. So I'm also looking for my own, I would say, supervision style. So I'm much more flexible, perhaps, that some people that have been doing that for many, many years and they think that they have found maybe a system that works, you know, because sometimes it's what happens. The supervisor has their own way of supervising and they're not, uh, they not changing it so easily for the needs of individual students. Mm. So that may be it. But that being said, I, I still have a lot of uh, things that uh, I'm struggling with. So I'm still struggling with the idea of, uh, how do you explain to a PhD student that they don't have to be working, you know, 80 hours a week, but at the same time, this is not a nine to five job. So they will have to be putting probably more work than this, but I want them to also feel good. So there is a bit of, um, uh, there, there is a tension between these things. Or if I ask my PhD student to send me something on a Monday, probably he understands that he needs to be working over the weekend which is not necessarily what I'm expecting from him. I'm just asking him to send it to me on the Monday because I will not read it maybe over the weekend. So, you know, just send it to me whenever I'm going to be back to the office. I don't know. So I think this is hard to try to figure out, you know, uh, the balance and to help the, the students understand what, what is the balance between working too hard and not uh, not putting enough, you know, into the PhD. Because anyway, doing a PhD is hard and it, you have to put a lot of, of work in order to do it. There's no, there's no secret recipe there. Mm. Yeah, I also have a small team that I um, supervise or mentor in a way. And I also have one, one young lady who said she would want to send a report on Monday and I asked her to send it on Friday so that she can switch off her, her mind from work over the weekend. But then she said that would stress her even more and she felt like, oh, but I need the time during the weekend to get a good report done. And then I told her, look, it doesn't have to be like thesis style. I just need some bullet points of what happened, where you are, where you need support, really nothing complicated. But it took also, like you said, it took a lot of expectation management. And the ex like my expectation was really low. I just wanted to have some conversation flow going to protect people on my team from exhausting themselves. And yeah. that put even more pressure on them because they thought, oh, no, I have to report and and that will be, then be evaluated. It's like, no, it's not for evaluation. It's just to give you a support system and a structure 
where we can get to know each other and something that yeah and for you, you to to be able to have the weekend for yourself <laughs> yeah That's no no what i tell them is that it's it's uh it's something that they send that's uh let's say a purpose for conversation and actually what i really don't like doing is not seeing them so i'd rather that they send something to me and then they drop by and we can have a conversation rather than me having to put comments in a word document because the comments when they read them depending on their own mental state, they may interpret it for worse than what it is or better than what it is. But mm -hmm. when you are talking, you know, with your student, then the student gets the chance of clarifying his or her position. The student mm -hmm. gets a chance to question what it is that you meant. And so you actually, I think, go much faster. And then in mm -hmm. a way, it's like working together. So I don't want to be evaluating you all the time. I want to be working with you to make mm -hmm. sure that you are actually doing the PhD project that you wanted to do and that you do it in the best possible way. Mm -hmm. But it takes time because if the student is a bit anxious already, usually the student wants to avoid seeing the supervisor because the student gets afraid of being judged. And so you need a lot of work to create the climate of trust. Um, that really means like we're in it together, you know? And it's my job to make sure you have all the tools to go and succeed and success can take many forms. So it's also up to the student to know what it is that they want out of that. Mm. That's also what I remember from my own experience. I never felt that I was well equipped to face my supervisor, even though he was really approachable, really nice and always caring and interested. But I always felt like, oh, I don't know this uh, this experiment didn't go so well so how can i now be, like go to his office and and share so there's always i think we're all as humans or especially in the academic system we we are our, our own worst judges yeah um and to yeah to to create i think it's also on on the leadership position or the people in the leadership position to create a space a safe space where people can be vulnerable and accept that they don't um, create results that are publishable in nature or science right away. <laughs> That's normal. <laughs> but I think it's much harder in our profession because in a way, and it, it, it's a formulation that's a bit too extreme, but in a way you are your research in the sense that, you know, the, 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 thinking philosophy, the epistemology that you are taking, it, it actually transpires in a lot of uh, ways, you know, in the in the way you express yourself, in, in the way you actually are in this world. I think a lot of us feel that the, the, the difference between our professional identities and our personal identities is actually not that big. And mm -hmm. so when you're making yourself vulnerable professionally, you're making all of yourself vulnerable. It's like very deep thoughts that you are having about how, what is the truth and what is this world and so on. And mm -hmm. I, I think that makes it hard to actually accept and go somewhere and say, this is what I've been thinking. And I know you're going to challenge it, but I have to actually accept that. So mm -hmm. I, there is no secret recipe. I usually say we are in a greenhouse. So it's like, you're coming to me in my greenhouse and you're, you're bringing you know, some form of burgeoning crop of something. And uh, either it can fit or it doesn't fit that climate. And if it fits, then we're going to discuss what do we what do we do to make sure that that plant actually blooms. But sometimes you're going to bring me stuff that's yeah, you know it's probably very nice, but it's not for here. So every time I ask a question, I just try to make sure that you know we we grow the idea as much as we can because I think it's also a matter of perception. Sometimes the student believes that you're asking questions in order to kill the the, the idea which should not be, I think, at least as a supervisor, uh, my position. My position is just to, to make sure that you that you figured everything that you need to figure out uh, in order to grow the idea as much as you can. Mm. Yeah, and also to assess um, if it's actually feasible to implement. My supervisor yeah. used to tell me I was, I was how do you say I had so many ideas on what experiments I could do and like almost every other day I would approach them was like look how about this experiment how about cellular analysis of that and he was like at some point he told me Joe 
you know, it's really nice with all your ideas, but somebody has to implement them at some point. <laughs> <laughs> and I was more of an, ex an exploratory. <laughs> and I think there's also something that a supervisor can and should do is to help the PhD student in figuring out which of these ideas actually make sense in this context yes. for us as a research group and with the equipment that we have. And then we can nurture that plant together. Yeah, and then it's uh, it's also about then understanding how do you present your idea. So how do you make sure that the rest of the people around understand it's going to be a good idea? So mm. it's sometimes part of the struggle, part of the struggle that I've had because I, I I have been going through different departments. So every time I had to figure out a way, you know, how to position my research to try to to help them understand what I was doing. It's also most of the time the, the struggle of, uh, of my students because they come from different disciplines and different backgrounds in industry as well. And I think that's the role of the supervisor. So sometimes we may be throwing at you some new concepts or related things or whatever, but it's just because you need to make clear how do you relate to other things in the field so that people around you really see how you are making a contribution. So it's not to say it's already been done or it's not to say you're not using the right door. Sometimes it's actually really to say that's cool, but how do you make sure that people see that this is really cool? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and how do you think you, this will be possible to implement also? Yeah. Like, like to have a cool idea can also be um, a, yeah, a little bit of a reach sometimes. Which again also makes sense. There's nothing against us. As researchers, we're always at the brink of knowledge, which is really exciting in itself. And it's also challenging at the same time. Yeah. And as that might also be cause for frustration, which again causes stress eventually for many of us. Um, Yeah, it's, it's stressful because you're always judged, right? I mean, you feel like your supervisor is, in a way, evaluating everything, and then you have to go through whatever forms of evaluation you have in your PhD program, and then you're going to submit your papers, and you will, again, be screened by the reviewers. So I think you also need, in the, in the supervision, in the relationship with the supervisor, to find, uh, find tools, find ways to cope with that. So your supervisor can train you to that, can also put things into perspective. But ultimately, you know, academia is built in that way that you will always have peers having a look at what it is that you're doing, evaluating, you know, whether it satisfies the criteria of science, if you want to make sure that things are going to go through. And it's really hard, as you were saying earlier, to put yourself out there and be vulnerable. But if you don't find a way to cope with that, then I think the journey in academia is going to be really hard. So yeah. we need to see it as training. Every time you go to the supervisor, you're saying something, you're receiving feedback, you're learning how to actually implement that feedback, deal with it, and how you have to deal with yourself after a good meeting, or maybe sometimes not such a good meeting with the supervisor in order to be able to, to develop those coping mechanisms that actually are required to keep you know, mentally healthy. But we have to acknowledge that we're always learning through the process. And you are learning as much as your supervisor is learning when you're doing that. So. Mm. Yeah, and I think that's also some of the difficulties that most people, uh, PhD students experience, speaking from my own experience and also the people that were in the same program like me, that we are, we've come this far. And then we expected to work towards the title, like the doctoral thesis and the title that comes with, which will be part of our name. And it's meant to be besides the professorship, like the highest academic grades you can ever earn in societies. So there's a lot of pressure and again, self pressure. Yeah, self pressure. At the same time, like you said, it's a, you're still a student, you have the right to learn yeah. and you have the right to guidance and to supervision, to ask questions is part of research. I mean, we're not expected to know everything, quite the opposite. And yet the yeah. pressure is real. Well, it's also, so for me, it's easy enough. There is no Nobel Prize in information systems. So I usually <laughs> say, you know, 
you're not going to end up with a thesis that will win the, the Nobel Prize. So just stop putting that pressure on you. You're really mm -hmm. here to show that you have learned how to do research. It's just the entry ticket. And I think if you accept that, that it's a learning experience, and of course you're going to contribute to knowledge to a certain extent and so on, but you're here to learn and to show that you have learned how to do that, it can take off a bit of the pressure. Mm. Um, so you're also working with Remo, which is a research around mental health organization. Could you share a few words around the work that you're doing there? Yeah. So Remo is a cost action, so it's funded by the uh, European Commission. It's a project that lasts for four years where we are um, working on establishing uh, the evidence of the prevalence of the mental health problems in academia, but also uh, trying to identify the solutions associated to it. And our goal is to, is based on that evidence, be able to challenge and inform policymakers, institutions, and individuals about what they could do to increase well being. So we have a couple of activities to do that. We have created an evidence hub where we are gathering any form of publication. Uh, with some uh, data about uh, problems of PhD students, postdocs, early career researchers in general in academia. We are preparing a survey to be launched also across uh, Europe to get a sense of what is going on. And we are uh, training people to become mental health ambassadors in their own countries. So figuring out who are the stakeholders, what is so specific about their system. So maybe there are some uh, requirements by law to the institutions, to the PhD programs, uh, to the type of contracts that can be done. So to try to map things out in order to be able to have a better conversation with all these people who may change something about the system. You, we have uh, published a mental health manifesto that's on the model. So if you're interested about the different goals, you can go and read about there. And if you're interested in joining us, you can find uh, the, the Remo uh, cost action on the ECOS system and just join or send, send drop an email to, to, to me or anyone you, you can find the, the contact of and then we can just let you, let you in. So it's really a big community. We're trying to have as many um, countries in Europe represented as possible because we believe that, you know, <laughs> the power of change is in our own hands, so we cannot expect the system to be changed overnight. We cannot accept and we cannot expect, sorry, one uh, law or one decision from policymakers to change everything. But if each and every one of us, at our own level, we start to take some steps to be in a better culture, have better uh, supervision practices, have clearer requirements and so on, then we can actually uh, help in changing the game a little bit. So we want to be able to have a community of such people. Okay, so people, so anybody who's listening can really join also non-Europeans or, or is it exclusively targeted at European <laughs> Union yeah, members? It's that... targeted to uh, European uh, people first and foremost, but uh, people who are interested from elsewhere may also, I think, uh, join as a um, representative of associated countries, or at least uh, if uh, you, you cannot formally be enrolled, you can still keep in touch with what is going on and enjoy uh, any of our uh, events. Yeah, so there's regular events, some of which I've also participated in, and it's really exciting. Um, conversations and speakers that are um, lined up um, and there's a lot of resources already available that are um, both on the blog there was also a podcast um, and yeah and the materials that you collect through the program and then by the we'll, yeah we'll also have mm -hmm. a, a conference at the end of august in budapest mm -hmm. and so anyone who wants to present a paper, whatever associated to, to mental health and, and researcher well-being is of course welcome to, to submit a, an abstract. It's really a conference that's meant uh, for people to be able to network with one another and with us to share you know, the state of uh, what it is that we've seen around us 
it's not mm -hmm. only for researchers, so anyone who is, uh, I don't know, a, a career counselor in a university or, or, or anything like that, you know, people who are um, really practitioners, if you want, who are also helping the, the PhD students is also welcome to describe, you know, what are the challenges that the PhD students come, um, come with when they go to see the, the, the counselor at university? What does actually counseling mean uh, in, in that sense? So we are really open to any, any form of practice and, and evidence that's uh, related to the topic. Okay, great. So um, towards the conclusion of this episode, um, let's maybe summarize some of the best practices, how to maintain mental health, how to ensure mental well-being um, during a PhD program. We, we already met, uh, mentioned quite a few measures during this conversation, also in the beginning, but let's maybe collect a few points now again. So for once, it's also to have a structure, to have a good connection with your supervisor. What else? So I think when you're starting or even before you're starting, figure out the health system, your rights as a PhD student or you know the, your rights in terms of salary, vacations and so on. Think about building your, your friend system, especially if you're going somewhere else. Uh, you have to uh, identify the responsibilities uh, between you and the supervisor. So maybe something is given by the doctoral school. If not, then it's a good thing to actually maybe sometimes have discussion about that. There are some material online that can, that can help you with this. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to set up some routines for meetings, updates to the supervisor, anything that helps to actually build that fluid communication that we were talking about earlier. And that mm -hmm. makes sure that you're not going to, in a way, uh, drop out. I would even say that beyond the, the formal routine, you know, try to establish maybe a moment when the, the conversation with the supervisor is around the coffee and just you know break the ice and, and try to discuss all those things you mm -hmm. have to um, be thinking about uh, this, you know practicing sports and all of those things that help you in a way uh, your body healthy because that's related as we said to the mind plan some vacations so be realistic about you know the amount of vacations that you can take at a given time like in any other job but take actually the vacations Try to assess how many hours a week you are working. And if it's too much, you know, you also have to have a conversation maybe in terms of planning with the supervisor. I think that's uh, something that you have to consider. If you already start with all of those things, you know, you're supposed to be, uh, I would say more or less in a, in a good position. And if something goes wrong, you have to accept that at any time of the process, you can reset. So if something goes wrong with the supervisor, there are ways to have conversation uh, in order to, to kill the problem. Uh, maybe you need some external counseling. Usually universities providing some. You can find a mentor. There is more and more peer-to-peer uh, -peer mentoring systems that are actually uh, getting organized and set up. So you, you're never alone. So if at some point it feels like it's too much, reach out. Reach out and take the chance of trying to make your journey better for yourself. I think it's really important. Yeah, yeah, and the first step should always be to seek the conversation. If you feel that something is wrong with your supervisor, um, trying to address it with him or her directly. And there's probably, I think, in most of our experiences, it's just a ma matter of miscommunication. Somebody yeah. said something that was meant differently than it was perceived by one or the other, and that can probably easily be clarified. And then there's also a few. Um, people that I've met who actually changed the PhD topic even two years into, you, there's probably something that you can already publish here and then start new or take your project with you to another lab. That's also possible. It should maybe be the first step to take, but that's also an option. So you don't have to give up on the PhD. You can also switch the lab to find yeah. a more um, fulfilling position and and working environment to live in or to work in. Yeah. Or, or do a visiting some, somewhere if you can have some form of funding. So sometimes mm -hmm. just uh, going to another university, even if it's a short one for a week or two, seeing another lab, how it functions, it also mm -hmm. enables you to put things back into perspective because you know otherwise the only thing you, you know when you see as a PhD student is what is around you. 
And mm. I think, you know, it's uh, putting things into perspective is always needed for you to figure out what is really a problem, but also what could be the solution. Yeah, and also to learn how other labs and teams operate and what you can learn from their best practices and yep. introduce. Not to expect that the supervisor should come with all the solutions, but we can, like as PhD students, we can also make suggestions and, and what we need as a support system. I heard that many PhD students don't have regular meetings with their team or with their supervisor. And I feel that's essential to at least yeah. meet once a week to have some sort of conversation and reflection on our own work. And if that's not the case, then you can ask for it. And like, hey, I need a reflection point. I need somebody to bounce ideas with. I need somebody to share my experiences with. And that can sometimes be another PhD student in another topic, just to learn that everybody has the same struggles. And that already can be a big ease of mind or a big stress. Yeah, I think the... Escalate. Sorry, the, the, the N Square Max Planck Foundation survey shows that uh, if you, I think it's if you are uh, meeting like every two weeks with your supervisor, you are already mm -hmm. have less risks of feeling high levels of anxiety because mm -hmm. you know you have established that uh, a regular uh, rapport, if you want. But mm -hmm. I think it's important to mention to the people who are listening that there are also stages in the PhD uh, program, so. I would expect you to be able to be more able to, to, to find solutions, you know, after two years of your PhD. When you are starting, it's actually normal that you rely more on the institution and the supervisor and so on. Mm -hmm. So we are not asking you to actually be able to take fully charge of the process in the beginning, because in the beginning, you don't know what the process is going to be like and what it's going to be about, right? So mm -hmm. it's also about understanding what level of responsibility you can take about your own doctoral journey, knowing that that level of responsibility is going to just be increasing uh, until, you've, until you've finished. And that's mm -hmm. also a sign that you're finished when you're actually able to take the full responsibility of your program and your research and, and all of that. So in mm -hmm. the beginning, don't, don't feel overwhelmed. Yeah, and now you're right. Like we said earlier, you PhD students have the right to holidays. PhD students have the right to recreational times over the weekend, like not too long working hours. Um, and then if the experiments are asking for, you have to be in the lab until 10 p.m. because that's when your mice breed, I don't know, whatever. Sometimes the, um, the experimental setup just asks for crazy work hours. But that also comes with compensation time. Then you can compensate and come in later. And as long as you talk to your colleagues and make sure that the workflow is still running for everyone, then you know there's always like we don't have to exhaust ourselves too too crazily, as as demanding as the, the environment is in academia. But there's also ways to mitigate the stress factors, much of what we've covered here. I think it's you have to realize it's work. So in industry, sometimes you also have crazy hours. I don't know, maybe you could be in accounting and have crazy end of the month, or you could be in consulting and have crazy deadlines and so on. So there's always, in any job, there is a moment where you have to work a little bit more. But once you have done that, you know, a little bit of a stretch, maybe to finalize your experiment or something, then you take time to actually uh, restore your energy in some way. I think that's what's important. Not to make academia look like the worst place in the world, because we are actually very lucky. We can have ideas that we can pursue without anyone or without many people telling us what to do. We have our own pace and rhythm. I mean, Frankly, coming from industry, I really enjoy now my freedom you know, in what mm. I do. And I would not trade that for anything in the world, despite mm. the drawbacks. It's also something that sometimes we forget. We forget the nice situation that we are in, and we just see the disadvantages. And we, why do we do that? Because we're just getting too tired of the stuff. So sometimes yeah. we work a lot, and then we rest, so that we are able to actually work again. 
the, mm. the mistake is not resting. Yeah, I like that that you also highlight that like academia is actually a wonderful working environment, and it helps also. I think we we had a um, we had stressed this earlier, like to find purpose in the work that we do to see meaning. Yeah. And getting out of bed every morning also helps us pull through the difficult times, which certainly will come. And then also sometimes life gets in between. But as long as we see and realize why we do what we do, that there's meaning to our work, I think it also makes it much easier. No, I totally agree with you. That's why, in a way, the choice of the of the PhD topic is really important as much as the choice of the supervisor. So sometimes I see people asking questions like, oh, I've been accepted to this program and that program. Which one do you think is more prestigious and where should I go? And for me, the answer is never about the prestige of the position. It's about, you know, where is the PhD, the topic that you really want to pursue, the group that you think is going to help you most or the supervisor in whom you have a priori more more trust you know and mm. then if you actually cho choose the right place you'll have a better sense of purpose so probably your experience will be better and if your experience is better you will shine prestige of the university or not that's just my take i know that some people go for the, the name of a specific university i've never mm. done that I, I don't see that working in that way. yeah to me it was also like most important was the research topic and then to for me to understand why it was important to me. Why did I, as Joe, want to study this? Yeah. Um, which is not always clear from the beginning, but I think it starts with us being fascinated with something we observe and then to want to dig deeper and then we find purpose along the way. And that's yeah. also a beautiful journey of undiscovery journey. And you have Great. to have the right supervisor for that. Yeah. So I remember that when I started my PhD, I was given the topic on augmented reality. And in the beginning, I, I, was, uh, I was frustrated, actually, because it didn't make sense to me. What, what does it mean to augment reality? Reality is what it is. You don't augment it. Mm -hmm. But my supervisor was actually uh, open so that I ended up you know, doing something about augmenting humans with augmented reality. And that's a topic I did not actually drop since. And it's like, you know, 10 years since I started my PhD. So mm. it's, it's thanks to our openness that, and so my own willingness to try to be curious and figure out something that I found fascinating in my topic and the way in which she received actually my curiosity. So, you know, mm. it's, uh, it, it's not always easy, but that's why, again, you need the good communication. So I think we're always going in circles. Yeah, and this is also, I think, what makes us human to interact with each other, to learn from each other, to grow together. It's, yeah, it's, it's really exciting. To research is never done in isolation. Yeah. But, I mean, well, many people find themselves isolated, but that's when the issues start. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you do research in a group, you are motivated by discussion, Mm -hmm. Even if in your group there is nothing like that, if there is a, even a reading group of some form of community. I remember when I was writing, I was feeling quite alone, but then mm -hmm. um, I was joining, I don't remember the name of that, but there is an initiative that's like a sit, sit down and write. And I think mm -hmm. it's like every Tuesday they were having people join on Twitter and say, oh, I'm going to be writing now. And, you know, people would be encouraging each other. And I wow. never saw the face of these people. But in a way, knowing that I was not alone, that really helped me. Mm. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm also in such a group for um, implementation where you are with, I don't know, like 20, sometimes 50 other people in a Zoom room and you don't talk to each other, but they can also be exchanged in breakout sessions. And that's also what I plan for the community we're building with access to perspectives to have such implementation sessions set up for, for researchers at any career stage or primarily PhD students to have this room where what you would normally work by yourself on, you don't have to be alone, but you can be with other people like, like I just said. 
so yeah, that's that's probably also is that some that's something we've also learned from the pandemic and the, the mitigation of effect with Zoom and other other software platforms for collaboration remotely. Um, is there something you could point towards that the pandemic has taught us that can help us with maintaining mental well-being in academia? Ooh, I'm not sure because all the surveys show that COVID just made things worse. Mm. Um, so really not so sure. But I think uh, we can, maybe you, you can put uh, on the blog as a, as, as a resource. There is a website that's called ithinkwell.com, I think, where there are plenty of resources for you to uh, do self, uh, self-assessment or even assessments with your supervisor again about you know who should do what and what do I need now and planning my mm. PhD and so on. So I think that can be that can be helpful uh, mm. in some regards. Yeah. Yeah and also like what what I think is also a big stress factor is the funding security because PhD programs are oftentimes limited to two, three, five years until funding um, ends. And then what? And I know many, including myself, who have to write up the thesis when they're already out of contract. So, and then again, here also structure helps to give ourselves deadlines to plan ahead and to have options. What if I need more time than the program provides? Is there an option for um, extension, like to extend the program? Is there other funding opportunities for another year or six months. Um, so there's many things that we can actually coordinate and not let it ju- just let it happen, but to take control and, mm-hmm. and plan ahead. And for that yeah. also, I think supervisors can be of support. Exactly, you have to discuss it earlier with the supervisor. And then I, I think what I'm going to say is not necessarily a very popular thought, but I will say it anyway. Um, you also have to realize that you are lucky enough to have three or four years of funding. So mm. you have to try to plan the PhD within that time. Mm. And I think that, as we know, it's, it's complicated to, uh, to get extra funding, you know, and you know there is a risk that you might run over time. It's in a way, it's also the duty of the PhD student to be a bit organized for this. So I'm, mm. I, I'm coming from a, a place where I didn't have any funding for my own uh, PhD. Okay, so I faced the issue since the beginning. Doing research without funding is really not, not, not fun. But we mm. also need to acknowledge the luck that we have to be funded when we are and the responsibility that comes with it to try as best as possible to be organized to stay within that frame. And when mm. you know we arrive at the third year and we see, mm, I think that in order to finish, uh, I will need another six months or another year, then we go and we talk to the supervisor. But we also don't take the supervisor by surprise and to, uh, at the moment when the, the funding is really running out. It's a conversation that you need to have earlier on because as we were saying earlier, the supervisor has a lot of things to do, including finding funding, but he or she also has to know uh, what type of funding uh, to, to go after and if they will need to cover for you or not. So mm. it's about taking responsibility, I think, also for that. Yeah. Good. So there's quite a few factors that we could point out and towards many resources that will also be added to the show notes. So you can just scroll down, find them there. Um, feel free to reach out, write us an email if you have more questions to Stephanie. I uh, can forward them or Maybe Stephanie, if you want, you can also share your, your contact details. And um, yeah, the topic is um, of highest importance. Luckily, there's also more and more conversation around mental well-being, mental health um, in academia and PhD programs. There's many resources online that, that we can all um, dig into. And also, again, <laughs> Remo is a great project initiative and also hub for sources and information um, to maintain mental health during the PhD program. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Is there anything else you would like to mention now um, towards the end of this episode? And yeah.
Well, thank you, Joe. I, I hope that's uh, helpful for people who are listening to, you know, advance in their own reflection, maybe about what it is to do the PhD or to, or to supervise it. And yes, feel free just to reach out if there is anything. You know, we have all opinions, we have a bit of literature, but uh, we're still all together trying to figure out the solutions. So any idea is welcome. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, until next time, see you soon and um, all the best for, for your career and hope to stay in touch. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.